thank you for joining us at the 2015 Sustaining Our World Lecture. Now, please welcome Tom DeLuca, Director of the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Sorry for the false start a minute ago. Uh, <clears throat> it's with great pleasure today that I uh, welcome and introduce our speaker for the 2015 Sustaining Our World Lecture. Molly Steinwald is the Executive Director of the Environmental Learning Center in Vero Beach, Florida. And we invited her here to Seattle to talk about her work with environmental engagement and education and how we overcome the, na the growing human nature divide. This subject, the importance of connecting people with their natural environment, their natural world, is absolutely central to the mission of the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. Much of our undergraduate and graduate curriculum focuses on developing the next generation of environmental stewards, natural resource managers, and, we, and the seeding of a conservation ethic in all of our students. Some of our newest programs, the Fiddleheads Forest uh, School and the Mount Rainier Institute, reach back even further in age to, those, to connect with students in preschool up through K, uh, uh, high school, middle school and high school. You really can't start too early, and you really never can give up trying. Our relationship with nature and the outdoors is constantly evolving. You don't have to look far for evidence of that radically changing dynamic. That walk around this campus and look at the students or walk around Seattle and see all the individuals with their faces like zombies looking at their phones and not noticing them or the world around them. Most of us are guilty of the same behavior. Technology is changing so rapidly that we rarely stop and realize how we're all changing with it and leaving behind some of our uh, understanding of nature. But I also know that there's no substitute for the wild in the world, and there's no substitute for nature and our well-being. No screen can reproduce the wonder of a breaching whale or that overwhelming sensation of coming around a corner and seeing Rainier appear with all of its glory, or the profound effect of silence generated by snow falling in a forest when you're miles from the nearest road. There's a power in these interactions that can't be faked, nor can it be replaced, but it can be lost or forgotten. So how do we restore or preserve this bond between us and our environment. Our world is increasingly urban. We're over 80% urban in the United States. Can we restore that bond with these urban constraints? Our speaker tonight has approached this challenge through a number of lenses, including as a writer, photographer, uh, <clears throat> environmental educator, and researcher. Through creative partnerships and other outreach programs, Molly has tried to reimagine how we make the idea of conservation resonate with populations of every age and background, both for their own good and for the good of the world. And with that, let me welcome Molly Steinwald. See if my screen wakes up. All right. Well, firstly, thank you all for having me. I'm overwhelmed to be here with joy to meet you all. I do hope that I get to talk with you after I give you a little um, presentation here. So. Um, as he said, I'm the executive director of the Environmental Learning Center. I just moved to Vero Beach in Florida uh, four months ago, so I'm new to my position as the executive director. Before that, I was the director of science education and research at Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Pittsburgh. So I have made a pretty big shift in the last several months. And um, before I say more, I wanted to apologize to I Potentially some of my slides are a little bit out of order. I had some computer issues, and I spent a little bit of time this afternoon reconstructing some of it. But without further ado, I want to start with a question. And I want you all to shut your eyes for a minute and 
I want to ask you, then I was going to say with this question, this is one of these things, being in a university setting right now, uh, you learn when you're in a journal club group, you ask a rhetorical question, and then it sort of throws it back at the audience, and you remove the responsibility from the presenter for a minute, so I'm going to do that. Um, but when you think of the word nature, when you think nature, shut your eyes, and what do you envision? Just take a moment. All right, can some people let me know? What is, it, what is it you see? What is it you envision when you think of nature? Old growth forest. Okay, old growth forest. Vistas? Uh, mountains. mountains? Moss. Moss. Anything else? Plants and insects. Plants and insects. Rivers. Rivers. All right. Seashore. Seashore. Um, how many of you? had uh, people in the picture? By a raise of hands, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe 10. OK. Um, how many people had buildings in the picture? Any sort of building, log cabin or anything? One, two, three, four, five. All right. How about any evidence of other humanness? in the picture, beyond buildings and, OK, five, six, seven. Or is that pseudo-replication there, too? So you've got the same people. OK, so I've done this for years now. And I honestly wish I had been thinking like a scientist at the time, because I would have actually collected the data for it. Uh, but invariably, it's been somewhere, my guesstimate of 5 to 10% of the people in the audience have anything related to humanity when they envision nature. And um, what typically people describe is scenes like this, right? <laughs> There's no trace whatsoever of people in there. These beautiful, pristine landscapes where we don't exist. And it's interesting bec because we're a species in nature as well. The problem with it that Tom just mentioned is that, you, for, for instance, in the US, about 80% of the people live in some sort of a built environment, right? A suburban or urban environment. And so these pristine wilderness areas don't necessarily relate to their everyday lives. And yet at the same time, we have a major conservation issue where we need to get people to connect and to care. It's interesting, this quote from the former New York City Commissioner of Parks from 1975 before I was born speaks very well and is very uh, important to today. In the coming years, Right? In the years to come, man will be overwhelmingly a city animal. He will find nature in the city, or he'll be in danger of not finding it at all. And that seems true today as well, doesn't it? Uh, a lot of children growing up, this is going to be, if they're lucky, their contact with nature, right? If they have an abandoned lot somewhere. Maybe this is their contact with the sensations of water and seeing what little critters live inside there. So it's not the big stuff. But yet, that's the future generation that also we need to get to care enough to change their, their view of that landscape in order to protect it. If we move away from kids, think about adults on your commute to work every day. <laughs> You're typically not seeing those grand views, and yet we've got to get that nature to relate to their everyday lives. You know, this kind of stuff is the stuff you would typically see. With that, I would also say there's a compounding problem that people are spending. This is for kids right now. This is the latest estimate that I've run across. They're spending an estimate of seven and a half hours of time outside of school in front of a screen. And that's outside of school. And many schools are using screens pretty substantially at this point. So not only are you dealing with people who are in much smaller spaces crowded together in areas dealing with much smaller nature in general. They're also in front of screens the majority of their waking hours, not only not interacting with nature, other life forms and other natural materials, they're not interacting with each other either. <laughs> so it's a, an interesting situation that just seems to be getting worse. These are just examples of things that are thrown out at this point that are major societal issues, right? You've got obesity, ADHD, depression, school violence, you name it. It goes on and on. Uh, 
And so people are concerned when I talk with different people who work in the social service agencies or people in academia, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of what is being talked about is that the issues with nature in big wilderness are a minor issue compared to the immediate concerns that people have. So now I'm going to ask you another question. And you don't need to close your eyes for this one. But when you think of the phrase human well-being, what is it you think of? What is it to be, to be well and to have wellness? Walking in beauty. Walking in beauty? Loved. Loved. Yeah. Comfort. Comfort? In case you're comforted. Yeah. Toxic free environment. Toxic free environment. Okay. What else? Anything else? Yeah. Yep, so having the physical basic necessities in order to survive. Yeah, anything else? Huh? Health. health. Okay, so physical health. Yeah. Emotional. Emotional. All right. Anything else? Community. Community. Right, connectedness. So it's interesting because you can see that a lot of what is talked about is not just physical, it's also emotional psychological, spiritual, it's whole person health, right? Um, this is just a glimpse. I am not a hardcore researcher in this area. I wish I had the time to do that, but I don't because I'm an administrator now, but I really enjoy taking what research is showing and try to implement that into programs to affect people of all ages. So these are literally just a a handful of stuff. People will typically run across these things in popular media, but it's summarizing things that are currently happening. There is a growing body of research that does show that connection to nature is important for people's well-being. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, it's very clear, much is anecdotal, some's qualitative, some's quantitative. We need more control groups, et cetera, et cetera. But there's at least a trend enough. And if you've not read an, an article, there's a, a great article by Richard Louv who wrote uh, Last Child in the Woods, um, and Howard Frumkin, who's actually the Dean of Public Health here, talking about how nature contact, there's enough evidence that nature contact um, relative to human well-being is, there's enough evidence that it's important enough to use to, argument, to um, argue to conserve the environment. And there's more work being done in this area as it goes. So what I really want to focus on is the idea is we've got to get people to start realizing that the well-being, the health of the environment, is strongly interrelated, interrelated with human well-being. And that's going to get the people on board that aren't necessarily already hardcore conservationists or really love the environment or have had large-scale wilderness experiences. So how do you get all of the rest of the people that are non-choir on board? And many people don't necessarily um, have ill feelings about the environment. They're not against it. They're not anti-environmentalist. It's just that their sphere of control or their sphere is so small that it doesn't necessarily relate to them. And so in order to get the rest of, we need the rest of humanity on board, right? Because for years and years there has been so much environmental outreach and education, but it's not as effective as it desperately needs to be. So there are things that environmental educators, environmental scientists, conservationists need to ask themselves in order to get the rest of humanity on board. And with that, it's trying to figure out who our audience is, right? When you're trying to be an effective communicator, you have to figure out who your audience is. What is it that they value? What are their needs, right? What are their constraints? Um, really, what do I share, I think, is really important. Where do we share is you've got to find that commonality. You've got to find that community instead of just having it a us against them, beating somebody over the head, saying, you've got to conserve, you've got to conserve. So you've got to understand that we're all humans together and we're all in this together. And then how can I help them? So there are so many, and people have definitely said this to me before, my, I'm really big into social justice. A lot of environmental issues relate to social justice issues. And so what can you do for these different audiences? What is it that they need in order to survive in order to be more effective conservationists. Um, and what I've seen over the years, so I've worked in environmental education for a long time, is so much of it is talking at, right? It's not talking with. 
and so much of it is talking at, not even listening to. So the rainforests are burning down. It's your fault. You need to do something about it. It's like, okay, great. I have no food. You know, that doesn't help me right now. I've never seen a rainforest. I'm not even safe enough to get to the park down the road, even if it's a half a mile away. So it's been a very exciting time seeing over the last decade or so, I'd say more moves to work with urban populations, work with underprivileged people, and get them into the, the conversation of environmental education. And for me, I'm very passionate about this too. Fear is, is I positive, fear is only a short-term motivator. And I think that's particularly true when you're dealing with people that don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Telling them truly that the rainforests are burning down and they've never seen one and they have no hope already, all you've done is just reinforce the fact that there is no hope. I'm very adamant about that. And maybe somebody can argue with me later. But uh, these are areas of um, research that all overlap. Um, and there are experts in this audience that I would love to hear more from later. But the idea is, over the years, there's been more work done and more things written about the fact that conservationists and scientists have been trying to get people to change the way they interact with the environment. But you can't just keep feeding information about the environment if you don't understand the human aspect of it. So there's more work being done with scientists and conservation biologists, et cetera, starting to bring psychologists into the equation. Because the idea, and I'm going to um, hopefully do a decent job of, of quoting Peter Kahn, who's done excellent environmental uh, psychology work, who's in the audience here. Um, I've quoted him in years past, is that in order to, no, oh, I'm not going to do it well. Darn. OK, Peter, you're going to have to fix it. Um, the idea is, though, if in order to essentially heal the human relationship with nature, you can't just focus on nature. You have to focus on humanity. That was paraphrased. And it's, it's so important. Scientists are starting to realize, OK, if, if we don't understand the human aspect, how can we change that relationship? We need to look at both sides of it. Um, so these areas, so there's environmental psychology, which is looking at how people interact with their, with their environment, not necessarily nature, but with their environment, their surroundings. And then you've got conservation psychology, which is looking at how people are interacting with the natural environment with the specific focus of trying to promote conservation behaviors. And then there's eco-psychology, which is also looking at human interactions with the natural environment, but more looking at the, the healing and therapeutic components of it with the focus of trying to get an emotional connection there. Um, so what I've always thought, which is really exciting, and I, I threw nature centers in here, but this could be botanic gardens, parks, everything like that. They have an ability right there to take aspects of all of these different research areas that talk about how people interact with the environment and implement them into their, into their programs. And what's nice about places like nature centers, botanic gardens, et cetera, is those are typically neutral spaces, which is great. So it's a place where people can go for healing to get away. And if you have effective programs that are helping foster that connection to nature with the people in the area, then you're more likely to succeed. But what's fun about all of this stuff is that a, um, a lot of environmental education organizations have probably just been doing the same programs for years and not necessarily doing them in a way that they know is effectively reaching the audience that's right around them. And so the organizations that I've been with are very similar to a lot of other informal learning institutions right now. A lot of zoos, museums, botanic gardens, aquaria, et cetera, are going through the same thing of we have to become relevant to society's needs in order to change, in order to survive, right? We can't just be an organization that is about stuff. We have to be an organization for stuff, and that stuff is the community. We have to be giving back to the community. So a lot of organizations are going through this very interesting shift right now of who is our community, what are their needs, how do we serve them? And with that, we have to do a lot of self-reflection of, of what is, we're environmental educators, what is quality environmental education? 
let's actually reflect and think back. Does just a one-time school field trip talking about a place far away actually change this person's knowledge or attitudes or behaviors? Does it, does it not, et cetera? So this is just an example of some of the things that we've done over the years where we've asked ourselves, well, think back to when you were a child. Think back to things that actually got you to become an ecologist or an environmentalist or, or recycling. And common threads when you do this um, come throughout. So you've got, for instance, it's inclusive, right? It's meaningful, it's relevant, it's joyful. Um, you're getting dirty, it's making meaningful change, it's meaningful to everyday life. So these core areas over and over again with different groups of people that I've done this with, you have these common themes and then you look at your programs and say, okay, was this actually hitting all of these certain areas? And if they're not, what can we do to make it better? Um, or do we need to shut it down and start a whole new program? So it's, it's um, been an interesting time. So I've been in Pittsburgh for the last four years. And I have been focused a lot on youth in urban environments and how they're typically disconnected from nature, not only from screen time, um, but because they, they're sphere is so small. Even if you're in a, a city like Pittsburgh has some great, enormous parks, they're not necessarily going to them. So when I moved to Vero Beach, which I can't complain about, right now um, the Environmental Learning Center is a 64-acre island nature center in the Indian River Lagoon. And the horizon there is the Atlantic Ocean. And the mainland is just on the other side. And there's a, a bridge traversing it. So it's a, it's a pretty nice deal. We've got pontoon boats, kayaks, uh, winding boardwalks through mangroves. We have a native butterfly trail, et cetera. And people were saying, Molly, you've always been so adamant about connecting poor kids to nature. Vero Beach is known as it's the richest zip code in the country. And it's a tourist town. So why are you doing that? There's huge wilderness there. It has nothing to do with, with kids kids and connecting people that are essentially nature, nature deprived. And it's interesting actually because on, on the surface level, it does appear like that. But actually it's, it's a city where um, that particular county we're in is one of the poorest counties in the state of Florida, even though there's also the richest zip code in the country. So if you go a half a mile one way, over the bridge to the coast, you're in multi-million dollar mansion areas where that's just one of two or three houses that those owners have, and they're only there a couple months a year. If you go a half mile over the bridge to the other area, then you're in one of the poorest parts of the city. Um, the city, it's a small city, but it's still a city, and you're looking at people who've, who have dirt floors, you know, no air conditioning, et cetera. I've, I've never lived in a place with such extreme um, economic disparity. And what's fun about, it's not fun, it's, it's exciting for me. I'm really excited because the nature disconnect that because of screens, I truly think if you're in a rural setting, it's actually not that much different right now because of how technology is changing things. So many kids are still in front of a screen even if they live in the middle of the country right now. Um, and you're seeing that for sure with these kids here. Wonderful, the beach is it's so close, but they're inside. They're watching TV, they're on their phones, et cetera. So it's actually not that different than an urban setting in some ways. You still have similar challenges. And what people have mentioned, we do field trip programs here. And people have given, um, have said the same phrase that I've heard in other environments that I've worked, which is, my goodness, this child in the field trip, that was the first time they saw the lagoon, even though they live right over there. And I've heard people talk about that when people in Baltimore, for instance, there's an organization that brings kids to a field trip to see, the, to see the harbor. That's the first time that child's seen the harbor, even though they live a mile away. And that's, that's not uncommon. It really isn't uncommon. And I think that it'll be a, a great move when, when people start not being shocked by that, because it, it's the truth across the board. There's so many kids that it doesn't matter if they're living in a potentially nature-rich area. Their locus of control, right, their sphere of their everyday lives is so small that that isn't necessarily part of their life. So we've got to figure out how to get their everyday small scale life more nature rich and also valuable to them. Um, so it's interesting though with 
going back to, to the group here is if that's the first time that child has ever seen the lagoon and they live a mile away and it's on a free field trip that we brought them in, it begs the question of how relevant is what's going on in the lagoon for that child right now in that case. It's a wonderful experience that he got to, to see it, but we can't just have it be a one-time deal. There's got to be education that is bringing nature into his absolute everyday life. So he's learning more about small-scale stuff, what he can do to help his family, learn how to grow plants, anything. But lagoon experience is exciting, but you can't just say nature is a one-time field trip and go back to your everyday life that nature is not involved in at all. Um, and nature, the experience of large, larger scale nature does bring great joy, but there's also much joy that can come from interacting with small scale nature. So a lot of nature organizations right now are trying to reach out to the community to say, okay, how can we essentially replicate that joy filled learning experience that people get when they come to our space and do it as smaller satellites essentially into people's everyday lives. And it is a challenge. So I, I appreciated this. This is from Ruth Wilson, who, who wrote some lovely stuff about children and, and nature. So she says, far better to provide ongoing, simple experiences with the grass, not trees, trees, and insects in environments close to home or school than to spend time and energy making arrangements for field trips to unfamiliar places that children may seldom visit. So I think that those field trips are important, and they are wonderful, wonderful for a child to experience, but I also think that it's really important to be focusing more on nature-rich experience in everyday life on a small scale. So I'm just going to give you some ideas of um, programs and partnerships and, that we've done. Some are just ideas, too, at this point. But what I've been focusing on is really changing the perception of, of what nature is. And, uh, and I grew up in New Hampshire, and people say, wow, you must have done so much skiing. It was great. And I've never been skiing in my life. Um, because we never had the money to do that sort of a thing. And with that, you know, I'm an ecologist, I'm a scientist, I am very adamant about getting people to care about the environment and change their behaviors towards it. But I really focus on the fact that you can't just have nature be something that's far away and doesn't relate to your everyday life, because it's not, it's not true. <laughs> Um, and so I focus on what people have coined over the years, and I've coined too, is nearby nature, everyday nature, ordinary nature, small-scale nature, sidewalk nature, mundane nature. It's just that stuff is so valuable. And as a child, that's the stuff that really got me excited about science. My parents weren't scientists. They weren't environmentalists. But I was blown away by ants crawling on the sidewalk and grass growing through the sidewalk and being able to actually have some power to, to stop somebody from stepping on an ant. You know, I was able to do some good even though I was a very small child. And that's the stuff that, that drew me into to science, into being an environmentalist. So I, for years, as I went through environmental education programs, found that there was so little that was actually focusing on the, the value of that. And that's the mission I'm on, I guess, in a way. But it's interesting because it relates, though, to this human human well-being issue. And people, mindfulness is a you know, really hip topic now, right? And uh, Tom, you mentioned too, people are in front of their phones all the time. And we have so much going on, miscellaneous things, that we fail to see so much of what's going on in our everyday lives. It's not just nature. It's other people and expressions as they're walking by. It's the, you know, it's the breeze on your face. It's, it's anything at all. And uh, what I'm finding is that I'm really trying to get people to be more mindful, right? More, more perceptive of, of nature in their everyday lives, including other human beings who are a part of nature. <laughs> um, and as I've taught a, a lot of um, teacher professional development programs over the years, getting teachers to feel comfortable with not having all the answers, but encouraging students to ask questions and I'm realizing, OK, inquiry learning and mindfulness, as I'm trying to figure out where I've been going with all this, all relates to just observation and awareness and sensitivity to the environment that's around you. And so even with science education programs, you can be 
bringing joy into a child's life by getting him to realize that there's some amazing moss <laughs> on the, at the feet right next to him with a whole microcosm going on underneath that. And you'll see joy in, in children's eyes when they do that sort of a thing. Um, in the photography sphere, what I've done over the years is um, really emphasize that everyday beauty. And so what I do is macro photography, and it's an accident, I, I'm self-taught, but it was something that over the years as I was in environmental education, I would try to get people excited about the sidewalk. Wasn't it neat? There's so much amazing stuff out there. And it wasn't until I found out I had an ability in photography that I could actually show people how exciting it was. And so that's what I've done. And so it's, I mean, it's just caterpillars eating stuff on the sidewalk. But it's beautiful, and it is amazing. Um, what I see is really important in emphasizing this type of a thing is not only teachers, but parents typically are very time limited and very space limited. Teachers have incredible strain on them right now to be teaching all of these different concepts. And if they feel that they have a very small schoolyard, how can they possibly be teaching a conservation principle or a full-scale experiment when all they have is a lot? And so by being able to show them through photography, no, we just went outside and took pictures of all of this amazing stuff that was in that 50 by 50 space, you can change their perception of, of what's right around them. Um, and I've, I have a, a number of good friends who are professional photographers with um, National Geographic and whatnot. And we always had funny conversations where they'd say, oh, it's so hard. I have to go out for three months, and I have to sit in this blind. and you know, for three months and wait for this perfect moment where the sun's right there and the animal's right there. And I thought, wow, I wish I could do that. That sounds pretty nice. But it is really hard. But I always thought, no, you know what's really hard talking about patience is a mom who is dragging her two-year-old from daycare to the grocery store to wherever, and the child is trying to slow down to pick up, you know, the leaf on the sidewalk or the twig or whatnot. And she doesn't feel like she has the ability or the time to stop and slow down and value that little nature that the child saw. And so I strongly feel that that's just reinforcing to that child that your little nature isn't good enough. You know, come on, honey, we have to keep going. Or even, come on, honey, we've got to go to the park. But by saying, no, look, actually, it is really amazing, and it is good, and it is valuable, then you can help that mother or that father not feel bad about the fact that they can't get their kid to the park until Saturday. It's OK. You can stop. You can appreciate the beauty right around you in, in that 30 seconds that you have. So these are just example things. All the pictures that I would take actually were in tow with my children, um, as I was that harried mom, too. But I mean, it's just it's grass blades. It's amazing. And it's beautiful. And it is serene. And it can bring you joy. Um, it's, it's, the world around you is absolutely amazing. That's what I can't get over. So with that, um, we've done a number of oral presentations, galleries, multimedia presentations, art exhibits that specifically emphasize mundane nature. But with that, too, I also make sure that nature photography is people in the pictures. And just this is the kind of stuff that I think is really important, that nature photography is not just something separate. People are in nature, and we're part of it. So. I've done a number of, of things over the years um, individually with FIPS. We'll be starting them um, at the Environmental Learning Center in the future is teaching kids. I really have an emphasis of focusing on underprivileged kids that they can be, learn some basic skills of seeing through photography. So talk to them about the amazingness of art, and, um, color, texture, patterns, that sort of a basic art principles. And then very basics of using a camera and then send them out to their lot, wherever they are. If it's an abandoned lot right there that they're working on, if that's their schoolyard, and then you deliberately limit the number of pictures they can take so they're not just taking tons of pictures, typically say, all right, six pictures in an hour. And then that forces them to slow down and choose what they're going to take pictures of. And anything they take a picture of, you know, they, they need to think about what is it that made them realize that that thing was amazing ask a question about why that natural material is the way it is. Then you're thinking like a scientist, and then be able to present it to the other people. And the real benefit of that is not that they're going to become amazing photographers at the end of it, but the real success is when they put the camera down and actually pick up the worm or the ant or whatever it is for the first time. And then they could care less about the camera. 
So there's benefit in, in doing those sorts of things, and, and more organizations around the country are doing these types of things. So these are kids' pictures. I mean, they're amazing. And so they're starting to see the beauty of the world around them. These ones were actually published in Grist a while ago. And it's not only with little kids, but with high school students. And we've done exhibits of their work, and then them writing about how relaxing and therapeutic it was for them to sit there and see those types of things right around them. And these are, you know, six foot one African American males who are tough and all that, and they talk about how beautiful it was to see this stuff in a flower. It's great. And create their own exhibits. With teachers, this is really critical. I think if a teacher walks right by and never seems to notice the beauty and wonder of nature, the children are likely to dismiss sounds, sights, and feel of nature as having little importance. And I wish I'd written that, but Ruth Wilson wrote it a long time ago. I just happened to find it. And, hey, that's what I've been saying for years. Um, working with teachers, their Project Dragonfly, if you don't know anything about this program, it's great to look up. It is teaching teachers not only conservation biology knowledge, it's also teaching them how to, how to teach in an inquiry-based learning manner. And it is long-scale, full-semester graduate courses. And in that, they teach courses that are all about plants and people. So it's teaching psychology. It's wonderful. They, it, it, I learned so many amazing studies of how people interact with nature in buildings, interact with nature outside, et cetera, et cetera. And they're teachers that are taking these courses. And then they their children actually get to create their own experiments of, hmm, I wonder if kids are actually sitting at these tables that have flowers on them versus ones that aren't in the cafeteria. So they understand the scientific method, and they actually start understanding um, the psychological principles between human nature contact. And with that, too, is really heightening the, the amazingness of schoolyard nature. So you can take pictures, getting them to focus small, um, which is what they've got, that nature typically. Sorry. And there are amazing science questions you can ask about what, why are these three tree um, leaves, or the grass and the, the um, sycamore and the, uh, oh my goodness, what is the one on the right? That, or no, in the middle, buckeye. Why are they different? What is it that, that is beneficial to them being that way? Um, we've done a lot of work with underprivileged kids and getting them to actually advise us on how their educational programs can be more meaningful. So this was a paid high school internship program specifically for kids on the free lunch program. Talk about overcoming barriers, you know, per, get money to provide transportation, get them food when they get there because typically they haven't eaten that much yet, and um, <laughs> constantly get their feedback. And what we ended up doing is morphing a program that originally was just working at the conservatory and not necessarily relating back to their lives and over the years changed it so it was them growing plants. Not only did they grow their own food, which was really exciting, um, and they learned how to do that in vacant lots, but um, growing plants that they're purportedly clean the air, but we know they're fit therapeutic anyway. They would grow them, they would go to social service agency right across the, the bridge from the organization. We'd never worked with them before. They learned how to teach, and then when they would teach these folks that were essentially shut-ins in these social service agencies about how important it was to have plants inside and give them to them, and they would care for them. So now those folks in the social service agency had ownership over that, right? So now they have the ability to care for plants, and they know that they're good for them as well. And that was a wonderful intergenerational thing for those students. And these are just examples of those sorts of things. Um, what we're doing, what we're going to be doing actually very soon is working with senior resource centers. I think that's a particular, it's an issue around the country, but I think it's particularly, particularly um, critical for where the Environmental Learning Center is now because we have so many people in these beach communities that even if they are very well off, they're still very limited to being inside, right? They're just physically incapable of being outside. And that benefit of just being able to take your shoes off if you're wheelchair confined and putting your feet in dirt. I mean, so many things we take for granted, right? We're all able to do that. Um, those are things that so desperately need to be done in those populations. So even though I've focused a lot on those in most economic need, 
all of us, if you think about our well-being, we're all in need, right? We're all lonely <laughs> in various ways. We're physically limited, et cetera, et cetera. Nature can be therapeutic in all of those different aspects. Um, another example of things we've, we've done both in Pittsburgh and um, at the Environmental Learning Center is getting kids to unplug from their technology. More in Pittsburgh, we had them journal. They, well, they actually logged how many minutes they were spending on devices for a 24-hour period. This, and we aligned this with the state standards so that it was a homework assignment for a whole bunch of kids through their teachers. They logged the amount of time they spent on technology. Then they had to give it up for an entire 24-hour period and then journal about it. And it was actually frightening what the kids talked about. Some of them just couldn't handle it at all, and they just gave up, and they were honest about it. But the, the depth of what they were writing about realizing how much they realized that they weren't alive was really frightening. Um, but it was also very beautiful, because people would write things like, I looked out the school bus window for the first time, and I had no idea how beautiful the trees were at the corner of such and such. And these are middle and high school students. And you're thinking, wow, that was just giving it up for 24 hours. And it talked about, I didn't even realize I never listened to my mom. I was just annoyed at her all the time. I actually looked at her in the eyes for the first time. So it was, it was beautiful and amazing. And we did this with, gosh, I think after the second year we had, I don't know, we had a couple thousand. I don't remember anymore, which is too bad. Um, right now with the Environmental Learning Center, we have an old poet's house on site. Um, and we've never worked with them in the past. We're at 64 Acre Nature Center. We have a house of a poet that lived there for until she was 98 with no electricity and no water. She was in this maze, and now she's essentially an example of pioneering off the land. So we've been working with them to have kids come to the Environmental Learning Center and do nature unplugged journaling, essentially. So give it up, go out, sit, and just look at the nature around them and write about it, write about this experience. So from that thing that we've only started in the last couple of months, they're now having a regular nature journaling club. And what's wonderful about it is we are doing that so that it's completely free. And so you have a great diversity of students that are able to come to that. Um, well, as I say, with the, the, uh, we were using little elements of, of the psychology scales there are for connecting people to nature when we were working with the kids up in Pittsburgh who would give it up for a day. So they would be doing this as pre-post-test, and you could actually see over that period of time that their, um, that their nature they, their feeling of being connected to nature had increased. And it wasn't a full-scale study or anything else, but we've been using elements here and there that's been great and helped us. Um, we also focused a lot on kids going out and taking pictures of the environmental issues that were in their neighborhood. So it wasn't just focusing on the beauty of nature right around them, but it were also, they were also um, documenting issues of environmental concern and then writing about them. So again, everything was um, standards-based, too. Something that we've very, very recently done is, and we're trying to connect the whole idea of human health and environmental health, is, and it's happening across the country, big focus is on childhood obesity, obviously. Um, the Florida Department of Health has this 5210 project, they've said, so five fruits and vegetables a day, not more than um, two hours of screen time, and uh, one, one hour at least of exercise, and then zero fruits, fruits and veggies. They started this initiative. It wasn't until I actually had, had talked to them that they realized, oh, getting outside totally relates to what we're talking about as far as kids. And it's much more fun to be exercising outside, right, than being getting on a treadmill. Um, there are obvious benefits to that as well. So we started um, a very blooming partnership right now where they got kids, they were trying to challenge kids to go out and do their 10,000 steps a day. And we said, well, we've got, you know, so many boardwalks, I, I don't know the distance yet. So why don't they come to the Environmental Learning Center and they can go out there and they can learn about the mangrove tree crabs and they can be outside and see all these amazing butterflies and get their 10,000 steps in as a contest. So that was our first step to really working with the Department of Health because my, we were trying to figure out, okay, Department of Health really wants the kids to, to lose weight, right? That's their big focus and be um, physically healthy in general. I want them to be that too, but I want them to get outside and be excited about the environment around them. So looking at your partners and what we can both benefit from has been a great, great benefit. Um, other stuff that I've done in the past is working with high school students who are underprivileged and 
getting them to create their own design and then create their own window box gardens. Because I think, too, what we keep needing to remember is that if we're going from not just focusing on nature as l only large scale, but also small, a lot of people don't even have backyards, right? So you need to even take it even smaller down. What can a child in their locus of control do in order to benefit from contact from nature? and also be proactive in getting themselves to be healthier, and also greening the city. Um, so many cities have incredible vacant lots. Having high school students and, and other students involved in the redesign of vacant lots is, is critically huge, not only for growing food, food, but also for beautifying them. And one of the other things that we're just at the beginning of conceptualizing is dealing with um, older folks who can't necessarily physically move very much, they have ownership with our particular area at the Environmental Learning Center. The lagoon is in a lot of trouble. And uh, we have had manatee die-offs and, and dolphin die-offs, not, not nearly as bad as manatees. But one of the big focuses, a lot of the mangroves have been cut down. And instead of just um, fining people or um, saying, well, you need to care about the environment, you're cutting down the mangroves, you don't care, we have these workshops that we've done in the past where a few hardcore dedicated volunteers have been mangrove parents. So they help plant the mangroves, and then they eventually get planted back into the lagoon. So in order to bring in different audiences for this, you can talk about, and it's a great place. I see this place as, as a new center for, for horticultural therapy, essentially. And so you can bring in different audiences, not because they're excited about mangroves or they're excited about environmental science, but you start explaining to them that benefits of contact with nature, and we can have people planting mangroves eventually back into the lagoon, but they're also benefiting as well. So take these out to social service agencies, take these out to, um, to nursing homes, and they can have ownership of that, and they can also be helping us heal the environmental issues that we've got. Um, and then the last example I had, near last example, is a lot of organizations have large scale nature areas, like we've got 64 acres. We, um, we were able to work with a social service agency that wanted to, they really wanted to move away from the situation of having therapy be the therapist and the client sitting right across from each other in, a, in an empty room. So they wanted to institute walking therapy, the, the idea of being able to have it be less op oppressive feeling and, and nervous for the client. But then I really wanted to get people out in nature too, and they realized, oh, you have this huge conservatory, right? And it's really cold much of the year <laughs> there. What about walking and nature therapy? And very simple things can be done in order to accommodate that sort of stuff. So instead of we just let that particular group of people come in before we were open to the public so that it was private for them and they could walk around. We didn't charge them anything. It was very small. But the idea in the long run was to be working with um, graduate students of, of public health that could actually be researching that experience. We didn't get that far in it. But that's really basic stuff that a lot of places that are informal learning organizations can do. And we have a nature play area as well that we've recently gotten certified. But the idea with that is that so many preschools and Head Start programs are out there, and they don't necessarily have any nature experience for those young children. And there's so much work out there about the importance of contact with nature and child development. So the next step would be moving that into the community so that even if there's a very small space, you can start applying it to kids' everyday lives in, the, in their neighborhood. Um, and the very last, last thing, we have um, many homeowners associations at, um, in the Environmental Learning Center in that whole region. And the idea is to get those homeowners to be changing what they're doing in their landscaping in order to help the lagoon. But again, that what we've had a barrier with is that it's only people who are hardcore environmentalists that necessarily want to do that. So instead, if you start talking to them about the benefits of contact with nature, alternatives of landscaping, and that sort of thing, then you're much more likely to get them involved. And last thing, working with churches. Some people are doing it. Um, churches are very much about the spiritual well-being of people, right? Um, they are groups of people. So instead of just focusing on teachers and classrooms and what they can do, think about a church leader and all of their different members of the congregation. There is, in almost every single religion, probably every single one, I just don't know, uh, 
there are aspects of environmental stewardship in there. And so if you understand what they value, you speak their language, then you can get them on board in so many ways. And the, the Society for Conservation Biology specifically has a religion and conservation working group that I used to be on the board for. And they're a great resource. So if you're interested in that at all, then, then Google them and look them up. And it's phenomenal what you can say. You can say, look, you're, you know, to be a better spiritual person, do these things. Care for the earth. Get your children involved. And you're much more likely, instead of yelling at somebody, you're saying, here, this is part of what you already value. So that's critically important. So this is a question. Nature. <laughs> this is what I think. Can we change our search image? Not to replace it at all, but to open it up more, because I think that that's where so many people are in this small-scale nature area, and that's what they're going to see. So it's not an us versus them. It's, OK, this is small nature, but it still is a part of nature, and we are actually a part of nature, too. So I see that as critically important to moving forward. So with that, back to connecting people's health and environmental health together. And as an educator, I'd say sensitivity to life is the highest product of education. And that's what we always do when we're trying to trying to change the way people interact with the world. What do we really want them to do? We want them, we want them to care about themselves. We want them to care about other people. We want them to care about the environment around them. So then I feel like we really succeeded. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. It was wonderful. We, we have time uh, for questions, and I'd, I'd encourage anybody that wants to ask Molly a question to step down to the microphones that are on the uh, side of the room and, um, and uh, go ahead and, and continue the, the dialogue. So. Anybody have any questions? Yes. I'll get out of your way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. I very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm wondering, uh, given that technology is a wave of the future and that in a way it's like climate change where at least according to scientific evidence we are, you know, it's more about mitigation and adaptation at this point rather than yeah. reversing or going back to a place that we were. I'm wondering, since you had su such success with the photography, which is a form of technology, yeah. what other ways um, can you see technology can be leveraged to help people get into nature? Um, I think that, oh, what are they called? Geocaching? I've never done geocaching before, but I know that more groups have gotten out into nature by doing geocaching, and that wouldn't have been feasible before. There is a lot of, mm, I think there's a lot of disagreement about the idea of getting more wireless into park systems because then people feel less afraid of walking on the trails by themselves because they know where they're going, for instance. And I don't know where I am about that. I really am, am having a difficulty with that. I think that the internet has helped enormously with people actually being able to see pictures of large-scale wilderness areas that they might not ever see. And I think probably many of us in the audience would say that the National Geographic movies that they watched as kids got them excited about large-scale nature and, and things that you hadn't ever seen before. And I think, I mean, that's been technology that's been around forever. So I think that that's still a benefit. I was going to say something else. I can't remember right now. Oh, I think, oh, I think to a limited extent, it seems like kids who are engaged in nature activities in their city who are able to communicate with kids doing very similar things is hugely helpful, just like so many people that are researchers or educators and have the benefit of being able to learn from each other and say, okay, this was a success for your schoolyard. We can try to replicate it in ours. I think that that communication through the internet has been really helpful. But again, I think that so much research needs to be done right now to say, OK, how much technology is too much? How many hours a day? Is that? Yeah, thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody have any other questions? It's either really, really bad or really good, right? <laughs> so 
So um, earlier you talked about making what they learned um, in the center or in the classes relevant to their own lives mm -hmm. um, in that urban setting. And so I was just kind of recalling back some memories when I was um, working with students both like high school and with middle school um, and remembering having them like look into nature and doing some, I would say, interactive um, activities, but then having that conversation with them, actually they brought it up um, about, well, how will this get me a job later on in the future? And I remember it was like a middle school student who asked me that, and I remember not even thinking about a job when I was in middle school, really. Um, and earlier in one of your slides, you mentioned about a internship program that yeah. you did. So I think that's fascinating to approach that from like high schoolers, but with middle schoolers and elementary students even who kind of have that um, lens of environmental nature, how does that apply to like getting a job in like the real world? What conversations have you had with that and what kind of approach would you give for uh, educators or? Um, All right. Yeah. Uh, for one, I've never had an elementary student say that and I hope <laughs> They never do. <laughs> Middle school every once in a while. I um, or it always like reroutes back to money. Like, how is this gonna get money? Like either or. Really. So, just to you know get food mm -hmm. uh, for my family. So yeah. Uh, so I don't think that this is necessarily blatantly said, but would be implied is that when we are trying to teach the kids better observation skills they are learning scientific method, and there are jobs in science. Uh, outside, I really want to move more away from the standalone school field trip model mm -hmm. and be able to give students longer term engagement, so multiple trips or having more substantial after school programs or building what we have is uh, something called the Junior Interpreters Program where it's essentially kids in middle school do start volunteering and by them volunteering, and they are trained to be interpreters for our site, then those are now job skills because they're learning public speaking, right? They're learning how to manage our touch tank aquarium, et cetera. So those are things that would give them a head start into having a, a nicer resume, essentially. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, that work. Thanks. Great. Great presentation. Oh, thank um, you. Uh, if you kind of lump everything that you've been been doing, and am I am I coming through okay here? Yeah. Enough. Everything, everything, everything you've been talking about, maybe as uh, environmental education. You know, there are other sort of programs or uh, approaches to getting kids outdoors. Uh, one being sort of the outward bound Noels, take kids out and have an adventure. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering how you and maybe the the goal there is to go out and have fun rather than to go out and learn about things in, in particular. So how do you, how do you, what's, what are your thoughts on that? About, about wilderness type trips yeah, or wilderness. go out and have fun versus go out and learn? Yeah, going out and having fun as opposed to go out and going out to learn. Okay. Um, I am a big advocate of what I've called for years stealth environmentalism or stealth science education. And so the focus that I always want to make sure we have is we're going to go out there and have a fun, joyful time. And that's why I think that a lot of science education and environmental information that's given to younger kids has to have a joy component to it and a participatory component to it. Because if they're not excited and joyful, they're not gonna pick up any of those facts. So I, I really am adamant about the fact that let's go out, let's have fun, it's gonna be a great adventure, a great time, and you know what, they end up learning along the way the scientific method. Yeah. I call it stealth, stealth science education, stealth environmentalism. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm, I'm over here at the uh, stealth microphone. If Hi. You hey, good Hello. for you. Hello. I'm trying to avoid staring at this really bright light. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I'm a social scientist within SEFS yeah. working in environmental psychology. And some of my colleagues uh, at times have used photographs as a data set. Mm -hmm. And I was um, really taken by some of the images that you showed from the students. Has there been any effort to collect them? Because with enough of, enough of them, they become very revealing as to what is important, what 
what gains attention, how, how lessons might be developed around content. I was just curious if there have been any opportunities like that. There are definitely opportunities to do that, and that's been one of my pie-in-the-sky things I wanted to do for years. So part of my dissertation work that has been on hold for a long time because I have been an administrator and the full-time breadwinner for my family and all that sort of thing, so those things get put on the shelf, is actually using a mix of different environmental psych scales to see what people are perceiving on their their trips between class and the dorm, et cetera, and then using images, showing images, having them take those scales again and see if they're starting to notice more of the nature around them. So that's using, that's that's not answering your question directly because that's saying using images as the as the tool for change. But, um, but in the different workshops that I've done in the past, we have saved almost all of this, the images that the kids have taken. And I do have them. And it's been one of those things that I've wanted to do something with. So if you want to do something with them, I'm all for talking. And we're going to be meeting tomorrow anyway. Yes, we're scheduled to meet tomorrow. Yeah. So to Let's be talk. continued. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for your talk. You. Um, I'm actually a pediatric physical therapist. Ooh. Um, and have a really strong interest in and really promote the outdoors for mm -hmm. children with disabilities. And I think yeah. that we're really lucky in Seattle to have a lot of opportunities as well. But I'm just kind of wondering who we as physical therapists can be partnering with on the environmental end to ensure yeah. that the outdoors and nature are accessible for everyone. Uh, I know that some organizations at the forefront of it are Botanic Gardens and I can definitely give you names of specific people at Botanic Gardens to talk to. Uh, I think because they have a little bit more of a controlled, manipulable environment than a park typically, they're the ones who've been going in and creating um, handicapped accessible, for instance, workbenches for kids to be gardening, or adults or anything like that. Uh, so they, they're the ones I think that are at the forefront right now, is Botanic Gardens. And I truly, I, I could give you people right off. Um, outside of that, let me think, and I can, let's talk after, for sure. But Botanic Gardens, I can give you the names of three different people right now okay. that are definitely going down that road. They've actually, there are a number of gardens that have actually hired full-time horticultural therapists that are designing scapes for people that are handicapped and limited. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So to continue with that uh, idea of accessible garden spaces and natural spaces, yeah. I just had a quick question about the natural play areas. And um, you s we saw two different pictures, and I was wondering if they're generated by the kids themselves, something that it's just their, their job to go and kind of make a space that they love, or if it's something that's brought in, like experts are brought in and develop that. Um, the first picture you saw is the Environmental Learning Center, and that was created by adults um, before I was there. The second one is my children. Oh. Um, and my, my children are homeschooled, and they've basically been allowed to run wild since they were kids. However, it was incredibly exciting today to go visit the forest school at UW. What's it called? The, the Arboretum. It was amazing because I saw today... 12 children as a group create something that I had always only seen my children create, which is stuff out of all sorts of natural materials and old string and whatever else they found in the woods. And I've always been interested in forest schools. And seeing that today gave me so much hope for replicating that for the future. So there are um, some nature play areas allow the kids to create it entirely. Mm -hmm. And again, I think botanic gardens are doing a great job with that because what they'll do is they just have all sorts of cuttings and clippings and they'll just, just dump them in an area and then they let the kids go wild and do whatever they want. So fort building, you know, playing in the mud, creating all sorts of little things out of acorn caps and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I've only seen them typically in botanic gardens, but truly this morning with the forest school, I was blown away by those children and how relaxed they were in the environment. And the incorporation of those art, like the toys, 
um, that are things that maybe we would find at a store, but still incorporating them into mm -hmm. the natural spaces as maybe a way to um, combine what we think of as human and yeah. nature is, is a positive thing. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and my, my husband worked construction most of his life, and he's been very adamant about basically it's not even nature gardens he wants to create, nature players, he wants trash. You know, and which people find in the woods, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got bottle caps, you've got rusty whatever, and there are things called adventure playgrounds, which I'd be happy to send you the links about, Great. where kids are allowed to do whatever they want, burn fires with old rusty stuff, and it's happening pretty big in Europe right now, and I think that that's somewhat the wave of the future, is junk and natural materials. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I think it's the last question. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to validate your uh, concern about having wireless stuff with nature. Yeah. Because uh, there's a, a lot of science that's been showing, um, I'm, I'm with an organization in Seattle that's working to try to stop smart meters from coming mm -hmm. here. Because uh, But with cell phone towers and and yeah. um, other RF things, uh, it, it's we, there's a lot of science that shows how bad it is uh, for nature as well as for people. So really I think putting point. putting yeah. wireless stuff out at the science center on the island and stuff yeah. uh, is probably not a good idea. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I think that there's huge research out there. There's a, a big void right now, not really knowing what all this technology is doing to our bodies. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to talk to anybody after.